If you have a Bible, I'm going right back to where we left off last week in the book of Judges, chapter number 6. Praise God. If you love the Lord, just shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Praise God. I'll give you everything I got today. And wherever I fall short, you can make up the difference. You're going to do better than that. <laughs> Praise God. Let me... Um, you remember last week I preached if, then, why. The other verses... I read the scripture and he said in verse 17, if now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Slipping down to verse number 22, the Bible says, then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, you remember this, peace be to you, do not fear, and you shall not die. Amen. And verse 24 says, then Gideon built an altar. He built an altar there to the Lord and called it the Lord is peace. To this day it stands in Orphra which belongs to the Abazarites. Same story. I'll give you another title for today's message. And I want to talk for just a few moments on a tale of two altars. A tale of two altars. Father, I love you today and I thank you for your word. I thank you for your presence, your power. I thank you for who all is with us in this service today. And I ask you to let your word go forth. Let it be delivered in such a way that it is applicable to everyone's life, that we can take your word and it provide that spiritual nourishment that we need every single day. Have your way in this room and we're going to give you praise and glory and honor for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. May the Lord bless you. I find that the call of God always comes with a challenge. When God calls you to do something, you can rest assured that a challenge will be involved. You might think that when the call of God comes that you're waiting in anticipation and it is a time of celebration and oh my goodness, he has called me and so let us rejoice. But in actuality, the call of God comes at a time of challenge and difficulty. The call of God usually shows up when you are feeling Pretty insecure. Call of God many times shows up when you are feeling lacking. You feel like you don't have enough for the job. You don't have enough for the journey. Of all times for the Lord to ask for your lunch when you're facing over 5,000 people. Sometimes the call of God just shows up in a very difficult and challenging time. For Gideon, one of the greatest men of God in the Old Testament, one of the heroes of the faith. But let us not forget that when the Lord called him and spoke to him and the angel called him out from behind the wine press, 
Let us not forget that there is not one battle under the belt of Gideon. He has never faced adversity. He has never fought against the enemy. All he has ever done is accept what the enemy gives to him. They're living in caves. They're living in these dens in the mountains. And, and this is just how life was. Uh, the enemy dictating how much harvest you can have. And, and there is no uh, confrontation with that whatsoever. It just became a way of life. So for Gideon, for the call of God to come to him, it was at a time where when Gideon was very insecure. Gideon was, was, was fighting within himself. Gideon didn't have enough. He had no, to my knowledge, there's no weaponry <laughs> whatsoever. He isn't carrying a weapon. He doesn't have anything. And so God just calls him to to do something great and he is going to do something mighty. And so he has to rest on what God is saying and not what he has. That's a difficult, listen to me, I've been preaching this year 40 years in the ministry. That's still hard to do after 40 years of ministry. Imagine your first task. Imagine the first time that God calls you and he asks you to do something and you have to rely on his calling more than what you have with you. But if you're going to ask for the call of God, you're going to have to learn to step out on faith and you're going to have to go on what he says and not what you have. If you want that call in your life, many are called, few are chosen. If you want that call, if you want to say, God, I believe that you have called me for such a time as this, then you are going to have to trust in the voice more than the contents of what you have or do not have. Called for such a time, you have to believe that God is calling me for this time, that I am supposed to be here for this time, that I was supposed to be alive in 2022, that this is when he wanted me here. No matter what your age is, you have to believe that God has called me for such a time as this, that I, I am here for this moment and I'm not going to let the moment Pass me by. I'm going to give it everything that I've got. You say, well, pastor, how in the world do we, if the call of God is coming and it's, it's here and I feel insecure and I feel like that I don't have enough, the, the lunch isn't big enough. I, I don't feel like the lunch is big enough for the 5,000. Uh, listen to me, the lunch will never be big enough for the 5,000 until it goes through the hands of the master. There'll never, be, there'll never be enough till he touches it. How in the world am I going to do this? How am I going to be able to do this if God has called me? Well, the first place you start is exactly where Gideon started. And the Bible said, and Gideon built an altar. Now, this is all I have for an altar today. I don't build. That's my daughter. She builds. I just grab things. But this today is going to be Gideon's altar. And I want you to understand that if you are going to accept the call of God, you cannot, you cannot accept the call of God without building an altar. I'm not sure that you heard that. You cannot accept the call of God and you cannot be in the will of God without an altar. And let me explain something about the altar. You don't just go and buy an altar. You don't just happen up on an altar. 
I want you to understand that altars are built. I said altars are built. They don't come prepackaged. They don't come uh, uh, where all you have to do is just set it up. It takes time to build an altar. You know why? Because the altar represents your prayer life. The altar is your communication to God. Your altar is you hearing from God and you talking to God. Now, I don't care how talented you are. I don't care how skilled you are. I don't care what it is that you offer to the kingdom of God. You cannot bypass the altar just because you're skilled. You can't bypass the altar just because you're gifted. Many gifted people bypass this and they spend their lives uh, uh, existing on their gifts and on their abilities and you can last for a while and you might enjoy some success in your giftings but you will not enjoy blessings in those giftings until you get to the altar. You know what I say on this Sunday? I say, oh God, we want to accept the call. We want to do what you have called us to do. We are going to build a place where we can communicate with you, mighty God. Somebody shout hallelujah. It is the altar, it is the place of communication. We will not be able to do what he's called us to do if we are not communicating with him. If there's no communication with God, if there's no prayer life, we're not going to be able to do and handle the things that he needs us to do. I will tell you now, the only way that we are able to do what we are doing as a family is from the very beginning, I knew that the Lord was calling us to prayer every single day and, 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 and earnest prayer and effectual fervent prayer every single day and I ask this church to go with me. I ask this church to join with their families. I can only hope that you are still doing that because I don't believe that it will ever come to an end. I don't believe we'll ever reach the point, we should never reach the point that we say, well, uh, this one's been healed, this one's been delivered, I guess we can, no, there is no easing up on the altar. I'm telling you, what we have to see in this final hour is coming through these altars. It's coming through brothers and sisters that's not afraid to get in front of the altar, lift up their hands and lift up their voices and go into intercession and call out on the name of God. Listen to me, point of mercy. We've got to have the altar. Praise God, we have got to have the altar. And I love the fact that he is communicating, that he is saying, okay, God, if I'm going to do this, then I can't do it without communication with you. I've got to know where you are. I've got to be able to talk with you and you talk with me. And I love that the first altar that he built, he called it, the Lord is peace. Or Jehovah Shalom was the name of the altar. The Lord is peace. I like that. Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. In other words, my first altar will set the pace for the rest of my life. My first altar will set the pace for what I'm going to do, whatever my ministry is and whatever my calling is, this first altar represents my relationship with God and that is Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. Hallelujah. In other words, no matter what I face, God is going to give me peace as I face it. 
He has, <laughs> he has no idea what is getting ready to happen to him. He has no clue that an army of thousands is going to dwindle down to just a few hundred. He has no idea. But you know what he gleans from when the army begins to disappear? He begins to think back, the Lord is peace. This one is left. That one has left. This one's gone. That one is gone. But I'm not going to get all bent out of shape. The Lord is peace. Father, calm my spirit right now. Mighty God, Jehovah Shalom, give me peace right now and calm my emotions. God help me in my ministry for my altar to be the Lord is peace. Help me as a pastor to believe the Lord is peace. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well, I, I, I don't, I don't want to get all, all bent out of shape when this happens and that happens and, and, and the storms come and the, and the winds start to blow. I want to be able to say the Lord is peace peace. Yeah, but yeah, but what if this one leaves? The Lord is peace. Yeah, what about the finances? The Lord is peace. What about the winds? The Lord is peace. What about the waves? The Lord is peace. What about the crisis? The Lord is peace. Is there anybody in this room right now that wants to lift your hands and say, the Lord is peace? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How about how about that doctor's report? The Lord is peace. <laughs> how about how about that financial storm that's hitting? The Lord is peace. What about that low down sorry devil trying to tear my family apart? The Lord is peace. The Lord, I, I don't know why I'm staying there so long. I just feel like maybe there's somebody in this room that needs to understand there is peace in the midst of the storm. Let your altar be an altar of peace. Oh, clap your hands and praise him. Traveled up 55 North 33 years ago. And I ran right in the middle of a horrible storm. It was as black as night. And somewhere between Osceola, Arkansas and Blytheville, Arkansas, a tornado hit our truck in fifth wheel. And my wife was pregnant with Brittany Leanne. All of a sudden, the tail end of a tornado flipped us over and left us in the middle of the interstate, laying there in the median. Had a person pick us up, took us straight to the hospital, got there. What, 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 what were you thinking? Was you, you better believe I was scared. You better believe I was worried. But you know what? The Lord is peace. The Lord is peace. I was fine. My wife was fine. And Brittany Leanne was fine. How, how did that happen? Because the Lord is peace. The devil's always going to try to take us out, but the Lord is peace. I speak peace to somebody right now. I speak peace to whatever you're praying about. I speak peace to whatever you're concerned about, whatever you're, whatever's going on, what's, whatever's coming up the road. Peace. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. What about all the things that are going on in our world? The Lord is peace. <laughs> Somebody shout hallelujah. He said he built this altar first. And he said the name of this altar is Jehovah Shalom. This altar is the Lord is peace. That sets the pathway for the rest of my life. Then he said that night, verse 25, the Lord said to him, 
take your father's bull. Sometimes the Lord has to say, don't take your father's bull. (laughs) He said, take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal. Now, I want to show you another altar. This is Gideon's altar. And this is the one that sets the communication and sets the pace for the rest of his life. But then the Lord says, I need you to get one of your father's bulls and I need you to tear down or pull down Baal's altar. There's some things that have been built up. There's some there's an altar that's been built in your family. You didn't have anything to do with it. But it was built. But it's time you tear it down. You didn't make it, but you got to make it go away. You didn't build it, but you got to tear it down. Sometimes there's some things that it's not your fault it's in your family. Boy, it's quiet in here, isn't it? There's some things it's not your fault that it's in your family, but it's going to be your responsibility to tear it down. You're not the one that built it. You're not the one that set it up, but you're the one that the Lord says, I need you to get the bull and tie it up to the altar and tear that altar down. You see, this one can't work as long as this one is still up. This one represents your ministry and where God is going to take you. But you're not going anywhere because you can't live off of two altars. One's got to be torn down so the other one can stay built up. I'm just wondering in this room today, who is willing to break some generational curses here? I just wonder who in this room is willing to say, you know what, I didn't build it. It is not my fault. I wasn't the one that set it up, but I'll tell you what, if this is going to cause this to be a problem, I'm going to tear it down because I want my ministry to grow. I want my family to be blessed. I'm going to tear it down. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you that there are people in this room right now suffering from things that you didn't build. Problem is, you haven't torn it down. People in this room right now that are going through things, it was it was handed down to you. You had nothing to do with it. All these other people are the ones that built it up. You've just learned to live around an altar you didn't build. Boy, it'd be nice to have a few more amens in this place today. I, you know what? I probably feel worse than any of you, but I'm preaching better than all of you. That's, that's a sad thing, ain't it? Praise God. I'm out shouting all of you. Bunch of lazy. I am telling it. You better believe I'm telling it. I, I, didn't, sh- I didn't show up today sick and nauseated just to tiptoe through the tulips. I come to tell somebody, if the enemy's going to get out of your house, you're going to have to tear the altar down. You're, you're, you're going to have to rip it asunder and tear it apart. You, you can't ask the altar to leave. You can't 
negotiate with the altar. You can't negotiate with the adversary. You have to let him know you are done. It is over. This curse is done. I have an altar, one altar that works, and the other one's going to be torn down. Who's ready to tear it down? Oh, give God some praise today. Hallelujah. Some of you have learned to live around an altar you didn't build. And here's what you say. Well, I, I didn't build it. Yeah, but you haven't torn it down either. I didn't build it, so why am I responsible? I didn't say you was responsible. I just said it's time. If you want this to work, you got to get rid of this. <laughs> Hallelujah. And let me tell you something. You'll never face the adversary with victory until you tear down some altars that have been built up in your life. Gideon is getting ready to do something that is literally impossible. But had he not torn down the altar, I don't believe we would ever have that story in the word of God. I believe if Gideon had failed to tear down that altar, I don't believe he would have seen the hand of God move from thousands to just a few hundred men and see the hand of God do something. So the reason that he did is because he tore it down. I just wonder today, what's waiting on you to tear down your altar? I, I just wonder, I just wonder what's waiting on Brother Chris when he tears down that, that altar. I just wonder when Faustino decides to tear down some altar, I wonder what awaits. I wonder what's ahead of Sister Viola when she says, oh no, we're gonna tear it down. What, what's, what's ahead, Brother David, when we tell, let me tell you what's ahead. Something miraculous, something marvelous, something awesome is awaiting you. Oh, it's time to get violent and tear this thing down and watch where God wants to take us. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> For this to work, this has got to go. And some of you are wondering why this isn't working. This isn't working as long as that one is still standing. And I want you to know that the prayer that you're wanting to pray and the altar that you're wanting to rebuild I want you to do it, but I want you to tear down this altar because your rebuilding is in vain if you don't tear this down. Amen. Hallelujah. I know why it's quiet. <laughs> I know the Lord is speaking to some people right now. There's some things going over in your mind and you're thinking, dear God, I'm about to, I'm about to tear some stuff down, some stuff that has... You didn't build it. You just live around it. And when you live around it, you just pick it up. And you just, you've just, you just picked up a habit. You've picked up a, something from just the altar, just, just it being there. And nobody tore it down, but here you come. Here you come. And you say, I want this to work. So I'm going to tear this down. The Bible said that when the men of the town rose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was broken down. And Asherah beside it was cut down. And the second bull was offered on the altar that had been built. And they said to one another, Who has done this thing? They didn't question who built this thing. They just got tore up when this one was broken down. Listen, if, if, if you want to stir up some hell, start tearing down Baal's altars. 
You, you want to stir up the enemy? Start tearing down his altars. Boy, you're going to get some folks riled up. You're going to get, you're, you're going to get the enemy asking, who tore down the altar? Who has done this thing? And someone said, after they had searched and inquired, somebody said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. All right? So now we have a father who let this be built in his home. Maybe was even a part of it. Who knows? But it's built here. And now they find out that his son is the one that tore it down. So what do you think Joash is going to do? <laughs> the Bible said, but Joash said to all who stood against him, will you contend for Baal? Or will you Save him. Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a God, let him contend for himself because his altar has been broken down. Let me, let me break this down to you, what's going on. Joash stands up for his son. One generation defends the next generation. And can I tell you something today? When, our, when this generation, when our young people, Lord, I feel the Holy Ghost on this right now. When our young people start standing up and they start coming against the adversary, we need the generation that is behind them to get behind them, cheer them on, clap for them. Hallelujah. Let them know we promote you, we support you, we're behind you. If they are going to tear down the altar, let them do it with us cheering them on every step of the way. We need, we need the spirit of Joe Ash in the church. We need, we need the spirit that says, hey, if my, listen, if my boy's going to tear down the altar, I'm going to stand up for him. I don't care what our young people do. We ought to be behind them 110%. I don't care if they're signing, if they're singing, if they're playing an instrument, if they're working in the sound, if they're working in media, if they're working on, I don't care where they're working. We ought to be the first one on our feet saying, that's my boy, that's my girl. Oh yes, because what they're doing is helping tear down the altars that have been built up. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. We need, we need the spirit of Joe Ash behind. Listen, they might not do everything exactly right, but that's all right. We, we'll, we'll applaud them for their effort. And I want every young person in this, in this building to know something. Your pastor is behind you 100%. I'm behind you 100%. You're, hey, you are not perfect and you're going to slip up, but you won't find me on the side throwing up your mistakes and throwing up where you fail and, and throwing up where you might have messed up. Here's where you're going to find me on the sidelines cheering you on. Say, hey, get back up. Get back up. Get back. I'm, I'm for you. I'm with you. I'm behind you. Get back up. will never raise an altar-destroying generation as long as we are negative about them. And as long as we're putting them down, they'll never put any altars down. But if we build them up, they'll get some altars up and they'll also tear some altars down. Hallelujah. Therefore, on that day, Gideon was called Jerubel. That is to say, let Baal contend against himself because he broke down his altar. He had a name change. He went from Gideon 
the guy hiding behind the wine press, to Jerubel, the guy that became known as tearing down the altar of Baal and was willing to go toe-to-toe with Baal. I'd like to see a name change in our generation in this church, our young folks. Instead of you being the, the shy, insecure... I'd like for you to go toe-to-toe with the adversary and you to become known as Jerubel. As you to become known as, oh, I, I know who that is. That's the one that busted Bell's face. That's the one that went all UFC on Bell. That's the one that went all WWE on Bell. That's the one that went all what? I want you to be known as the one that tore down that altar and you step from there. Oh, hallelujah. Final verse, verse 24. I'm sorry, verse 30, this may be 34. He said, but the spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon. And he sounded the trumpet. And the Abazarites were called out to follow him. The Spirit of the Lord covered him. And he took the trumpet, which represents the word of the Lord, and he began to sound it. And we sounded the word of God a guy that had nobody all of a sudden had followers. (laughs) A guy that had nobody, that had no experience whatsoever, all of a sudden now has those that follow him and he's ready. He is ready for the battle. I'm talking about the spirit of the Lord clothing us today I'm talking about once this is torn down once once this is is done with and you, you you'll have to determine what this is you'll have to figure out what's got to be torn down but once it's done Jehovah Shalom the Lord is peace and his spirit covers you and you sound the trumpet you'll be amazed who's going to be with you in the midst of the battle. Stand with me right now in Jesus' name. So I wonder what this is. I wonder for our young people today what this represents. Some things that have been built up in your family. Maybe... Maybe there's anger. Maybe there's jealousy. Maybe there's hatred. Maybe there's envy. Maybe there's strife. I don't know what that is. But it's got to be torn down. And you are the one that has to tear it down today.